Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot and today we are going to fly the Airbus A319 for the first time. And we are sitting in the Tonus 319 over here equipped with IAE engines. So first time featuring these engines on the channel and most importantly first time flying an EPR equipped Airbus in X-Plane on this channel. So in this video, I'm going to give you quite a couple of explanations on what's exactly going on with those EPR gauges and how you will handle such a motor and, of course, some of the peculiarities of that airplane. But for now, we are standing at Milano Malpensa Airport and I'm very much looking forward to fly this on to Stuttgart, which resembles the real Eurowings Flight 2823, which is just about 40 minutes flight time very quick hop across the Alps. Weather is great everywhere today, but why don't you hop into the cockpit and have a look into some of the plans of the flight. And here we are in the A319 cockpit. So, we are standing at Milano as I mentioned, and now let's have a look into what we're about to do today. So, Let's have a look into this. Alright, so for the standard amount of fuel... Oopsie, didn't mean to uh, turn that around. Standard amount of fuel today. Let's have a look at the second page. 5.1 plus the taxi fuel, so 5.3 tons of fuel. Now let's quickly check the weather to see if we can actually take that, but I do believe we can. Okay, Stuttgart, Cavalcay, variable winds, alternate Düsseldorf, variable winds, few clouds, Cologne, variable winds, few clouds, Munich, same, Frankfurt, same. Okay, perfect. In other words, this is perfectly fine to take the um, standard fuel, so we are going to go with just about 5.3 tons of fuel. Okay, a cool little thing that a couple of you have uh, taught me on this airplane is when you click the mechanic button in here on the audio control panel, you can actually directly control things like the fuel amount you want to take. So let's go for 5.3 tons of fuel, request that. And then let's also load up our cargo. So we aren't going to take too much here, 500 kilos in the front hold. And that's about it. So, quite a cool feature if you ask me. However, nonetheless, let's still quickly go into the Tolis plugin, into the ISCS, to make sure that our load matches exactly what we've planned. So we're gonna go with four, sorry, 5.3 tons of fuel here, like so. And then for the passengers, we are pretty much full, 145 plus 500 in the front hold. And that is exactly what we're gonna take. All right, with our airplane loaded up, how about we start our cockpit setup? So weather radar is off, engine masters off, and gear levers down, wipers off. Okay, let's check the battery voltages. Greater 25.5, we're already running on external power. However, I am going to do a quick APU fire test as well, because I am going to fire the APU up straight away, since it is fairly warm outside. Can't see it yet, but temperatures are in the region of about um, 30 degrees today. So that's certainly a reason to get the APU going straight away. Also, I'm going to turn the APU bleed on straight away, because there is no limitation on how long you have to wait until you can run the APU bleed in the Airbus aircraft. And that means that our best indicator for the APU running is simply to put the bleed button on, and we will immediately hear the um, air flowing once the APU is there. Okay, IRS, one, two, and three. And with that, we can quickly verify our oxygen, 1850, sufficient hydraulic quantity, sufficient oil quantity, flap lever agrees, speed brakes retracted, and then we do have trucks in position, so let's go brakes off. And now we're gonna check the um, the brake system, as you can see, it is working. Brakes back on, and that is it. Oh, Accu pressure is in a range where it is still alright. And here we go, APU is running. Perfect. 
So let's do a cockpit preparation. Again, all white lights out, plus a couple blue lights on. And that's pretty much it. Pack flow we are going to use normal today. With the ABU running, the pack flow is always in high anyway, so we don't need to worry too much about that. But um, once we're in engines, normal is going to do. You can see it's 29 degrees outside, so it is fairly warm, but that's totally fine. Okay, let's quickly start a charging cycle for our batteries. Let's put them off and on again. You can see the amperage going up, and that means the batteries are charging. Now, if we take things very exact, then we did already char start a charging cycle because we were powered on external power when I put the batteries off in order to check for our um, in order to check for the battery voltage. So basically, that was done already. That is why we didn't see too much our reaction. Also, as you can see, we've got the engine in one mode selector up here which uh, you have on all EPR equipped aircraft. Okay then, let's have another quick look into the weather. So, over at Milano, 1018 it is. Go, 1018, 8 and 8. Perfect. Okay then, weather radar, we can turn multi-scan and, and ground clutter suppression on, it's calibrated, the tilt, let's put somewhere around 5, even though you're probably not going to need it anyway. Okay, and then finally the TCAS goes into a buff, and then we can start our FMS setup. So we're going from Milano, and I'm going to do a manual FMC setup here. You guys have seen me uplinking it so many times already, but we don't really do those manual setups in the simulator too much because everybody just likes to go ahead and simply request their stuff. But that's quite boring, isn't it? In the end, you always need to know how to do that stuff manually, so how about we just do that today? Okay, so you're wing 5.9 Mike Golf, which is the uh, real life. Call turn on the flight, cost in X20, flight level 240. Okay, flight plan, departure from runway 35 right here in Milano. And we're gonna go by the Serrano 6 Sierra departure towards Serrano. And then we join the airway towards Desip already, perfect. So that's all we need. Okay, Serrano, then Lima 615. Uh, November 851. And then Tango 125 Reutel. Here we go. So, towards Reutel. Insert Stuttgart arrival ILS 25. And we'll take the Reutel 1 Whiskey arrival, which basically takes us directly into the final. Okay, let's have a quick look. Yep, the sit looks about as shitty as I would expect. Overall, the best reason to tell if the routing is valid by EASA standards is the shittier it looks, the more valid it, prob it probably is. Okay then, for the engine out sit, let's see if we can find anything. So just give me about a second. I should have prepared that before I started the recording. Obviously, I did not. Okay, so Malpensa Rome 35 right. We're going to proceed under the 4 DME Mike Mike Papa, then turn right, proceed on 304 in Mont Sarano at Sarano Enter Holding. Okay, so let's see how we can program that probably. Rome course is 346, so let's go Mike Mike Papa slash 346 slash 4, like so. Yep, that looks about good. And then a right hand turn, radial 304 inbound Sierra Romeo November. Okay, let's go Sierra Romeo November. 
and that's gonna be the VOR and this gives us 102 so that's almost uh, the radio 304 we're looking for I'm happy with that and then enter the holding 123 inbound right hand turns okay so hold 123 right hand turns and that looks good okay after Sierra Romeo November we are gonna do an immediate turn back so new destination Malpensa and it's gonna be an ILS Yankee approach 35 left in case we come back okay insert perfect just for the sake of completeness I'm going to extend the center line from the departure runway up here but that is really just um, because I got so used to see that line and it helps us a little bit with the uh, tracking of the extended center line as well okay Perfect, so, pilot routes, store active flight plan, and that's what it looks like, and that's how we can check our route later on. Then, let's go ahead with our remainder of the setup. So, we've got 55.9 and 27.3. Block fuel, 5.3. And that is what we have indeed. Alright, cool. So, takeoff data. Let's go ahead, reset. And that does look about right. So, compute config 1 plus F up trim point 7, 69 degrees. So, 1 slash 0 0.7 up. And we've got 69 degrees up there. Okay, takeoff speed 37, 37, 39. So 37, 37, and 139. Perfect. Okay, so that's that part. So let's go ahead and grab a couple of charts. Airport, Lima, India, Mike, Charlie. So that is going to be quite a lot of charts here. Verona 6 Sierra, get ABC only, but that's fine, We've, we are a cut C aircraft. No initial climb published, but at least 6000 over Sarono, so let's go ahead and set 6000 as, as our initial climb altitude. So then, quick check of our flight plan to make sure that everything is in line with what it should be. So, 1300 feet. And that is 1300 feet. And then Mike Charlie 607, max 200 knots, above 3500. So we've got intercept 607, 200 knots. And that is above 3500. From there, Mike Charlie 603, and then towards Sarono. And we've got 603, and then Sarono. And for Sarono, we've got maximum 220 knots, above 6000 feet. That's what we have in there. So, looks a little shitty, but believe me, once you fly it, it actually makes a bit more sense. Basically, it's unfortunately not really um, drawn onto the chart, but you can really see how you've got a city over there, you've got a city over there, over there, and over here. And you basically fly just in between them. And that is why the departure looks the way it looks. 10,300 the MSA, so that's something to keep in mind. However, Sarono is okay to be in 6,000. And we're going to get back to that a little bit later on when we do the briefing. Talking about briefings, I do believe this is a good moment to actually start one. Okay, so. Milano runway 35 right, Sarono 6 Sierra departure, first cleared altitude 6000. MSA 10700. And extra fuel, we have one ton or 31 minutes. So, let's have a quick look into the taxi charts. Should have done that before starting the briefing. But basically, there are no real hotspots. I mean, we are familiar with the airport. So, here it is, airport. Parking down here. 
So taxi is going to be straight out and then over into the kilos. And with a bit of luck, we get a crossing of 3-5 left. If not, we'll go by Golf Yankee Hotel around the runway and then Charlie Alpha for our departure. And that is what we've calculated as well. Okay, stop margin for rejected takeoff today is 1,105 meters. Engine out sits straight at four miles from uh, Mike Mike Papa. And then we do a right hand turn towards Sarono on the radial um, 334 inbound. That's programmed on the secondary flight plan. And all we need to do is to make this an overfly point, like so. And then we make that right hand turn towards Sarono. And that's it. Um, climbing to 6,000 feet, I'm happy with that, seeing that we've got the 6,000 restriction on the sit over here. Immediate return is possible. We're under the maximum landing weight. Special operations, I do not really see anything. Threats for the departure. We do have a big threat in terms of the terrain up here. On the chart, 5,580 is the highest, but going further north, there's even more terrain, seeing that we are flying directly towards the Alps. So 10,300 is the MSA. And seeing that there is no weather, we're going to use the terrain displays in order to um, circumvent that problem. Okay. Any questions on the departure briefing? No? Very good. Alright then, just gotta wait for the IRS to finish alignment. They should be done any moment now. And then we can go ahead with our flight. In the meantime, let's say hello to the passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome on board this Zero Wings Flight 2823, taking you towards Stuttgart. My name is Emanuel and I am your captain today. With me on the flight deck, a lot of lovely folks currently watching this video. We will be ready for pushback in just a minute's time, and in the meantime, I would like to ask you to sit back, relax, and most importantly, listen to the cabin crew safety demonstration that is going to commence very shortly. That is not just for your own safety, but also for the safety of the passengers sitting around you. Once again, welcome aboard and thank you very much for your attention. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, einen schönen guten Tag aus dem Cockpit. Hier spricht Ihr Kapitän. Mein Name ist Emanuel und im Namen der Eurowings darf ich Sie ganz herzlich an Bord unseres Fluges nach Stuttgart willkommen heißen. Flugzeit heute 40 Minuten in einer Reiseflughöhe von 24.000 Fuß. Wir bedanken uns an der Stelle ganz herzlich, dass Sie heute unsere Gäste sind, wünschen Ihnen einen schönen Aufenthalt. Wenn es irgendetwas gibt, womit wir Ihnen diesen schöner gestalten können, zögern Sie bitte nicht, sich an unsere Flugbegleiter zu wenden. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit und noch einmal herzlich willkommen an Bord. Okay, so, that is our passengers dealt with. Then let's see, IRS still takes a bit to align. I have a feeling we are running a rather old aircraft today. Oh no. And I accidentally hit. No. Okay. Well, that means we gotta turn them all off and back on again. So, give them 30 seconds, and I am simply going to do a quick align after that. And while they're off, we can already get the better pushback guys here. Sometimes I hate it when your mouse accidentally hits something that it's not supposed to hit, and then you are running into something like that with an IRS realignment. The only good news is we can do an easy and quick realignment, and that is going to solve the problem for us. Okay. All right, Captain, got the directions. Let me know through the menu when you're ready. That is not an Italian accent. So, one, two, three. Let's turn them back on again. And this time I'm going to do things quick. I'll simply go for a quicker line. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> that saved us. That really saved us here. I would not have wanted to sit here for another 5 or 10 minutes or so. Alright. So, you guys can start getting ready down there. Great news, Captain. Your toe's coming. Oh, wow. <laughs> Love it. Right, General Cockpit, please disconnect external power. On the parking brake set, you can remove the chocks as well. Cockpit preparation checklist. Gear pits and covers, removed. Fuel quantity, 5,260 kilogram balance. Seatbelts on, ADRs, 
Nav Barrow F 1018. Awkward preparation checklist complete. Okay, guys, why are the doors still open? It is about time, isn't it? Alright, looks like the doors and hatches are closed and we're ready to connect. Uh, no, they're not. <laughs> Can I actually do that over here? Cargo doors? No, it doesn't look like it. Okay. Here we. Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, so. Can't you close that door, dear cabin crew? And on here, I could have loaded packs as well, would have made things easier. Anyway, cabin crew on doors and trust check. Alright, so clearance is received. And let's just set some random squawk over here. Welcome aboard, Captain. Toes connected, bypass pens inserted. Go until the parking brake when you're ready to go. Roger, stand by. Actually, you know what? Um, the parking brake is off. Here comes the pushback. Light it up. Okay, before Star Trek's parking brake. Released, take off speeds and thrust, V1137, VR137, V2139, flex 69, windows, closed, beacon, on B4 star checklist complete. Alright, so IAE engines, they do take a little bit longer to start up, and for that reason we are going to start straight away. So, ground cockpit, go ahead, clear the start, clear the start, engine 2 start. Gonna love that Airbus phraseology, don't ya? Interesting as well, by the way, that some things remain axed out on the IAEs, but apparently that is actually normal. So on the A330 they told us never to um, commence the engine start until all the axes have vanished, but on the A320 with the IAE engines that is apparently quite normal. Okay, here we go. We've got fuel flow, and the engines are commencing their start. Okay, that's a good start number two. Engine 1 start. So, why did we just about hear the PTU? Normally you don't hear it in the cockpit, but I suppose the 319 is a little bit smaller than the 320, so you might actually be able to hear it inside here. Okay, engines are coming up. Just about done here. Go ahead and set your parking brake. Brake set. And we're disconnecting the tow. Give me just a moment. Sure thing. All right. That's the generator online. And that's number one available. So two good starts, clear disconnect, clear to the right side with a pin, and have a good day. Ciao. Hey, that's about point seven up there. So, do we have the hand signal in sight yet? No. Let's see, where are they? Still working on it. All right. And we're disconnected. Signal and pin on the right. Take these and have a safe flight. Cheers. Have a good day. Ciao. So that was certainly not an Italian accent. But I'm totally fine with that. The more English they speak, the better it is. And just because I totally know that some people are going to go mad about these comments. Guys. It's just a matter of fact that the English in Italy sometimes isn't that good. Alright, the pin is seen. 
That does, however, by no means at all mean that there are no Italians speaking good English. Quite the opposite, indeed. I ha had a lot of Italian colleagues in my former company, and many of them actually spoke pretty good English. That's uh, pilots and cabin crew. The ground guys were usually a little harder to communicate with, but still better than in some other southern European countries. Okay, after start checks. Anti-ice. Off. Income status. Checked. Pitch trim. That is about, let me see, 27%. Radar trim. Neutral. After start checklist complete. So, clear left side. Clear right side. Okay, let's get going. You can see the plane starts rolling all on its own. The idle thrust of the IAEs is rather high, but let's help it a little bit. Okay, brake check. Pressure zero. Okay, so we go into kilo and then continue on kilo. Left side clear, right side clear. Okay, that is Yankee over here. Hey, Kilo, next to the right. So, small airplane, gotta take the turns early enough. If I'm trying an overshoot like in the A340 or in the A330 with this one, I'm probably ending up in the grass. It's quite funny when you think about it. If you look at the outside of, of the plane, this is 33 meters. So this is about half of the A330. You can take two of them behind one another and then you have an A330. I'm thinking about the A340, it's even worse, this isn't even half the plane. Okay, getting a little quick up here. That's what I meant, you have pretty strong engines under this. And obviously you have an aircraft at a rather low weight as well. Alright, so I have no updates or changes to the takeoff briefing. So we'll just have to wait for the cabin and then we can start the um, checklist. So, there's two ways we can taxi this. Either we go straight at and cross the runway. That happens, well, sometimes, but it is certainly not the norm. The norm would be to go southbound and then via hotel all the way around. And I have a feeling that that's exactly what we're gonna do today. So talking about the idle thrust of the engines. Um, I do remember this one, especially from the time when I've still been with Aerosoft, like five to 10 years ago, when there was an adjustment done to match the ground physics of the real airplane better. Okay, let's see. Gotta go to the right over here. Like this. I have a feeling we turned a little bit early. There should have been Golf Yankee over there. But that's fine. Okay, then, next left. Looks a little strange for me. I would have expected a taxiway here, but looking at this, it seems that there is only gates over here. Strange. So probably the scenery does not match the charts. But okay, that is uh, fine. 
After all, we found our way, so we can now continue our taxi. So just look at how quickly we gained our speed over here, and how little thrust we used for that. Now, talking about thrust, back in the day when I've been with Aerosoft and the A320 with IAE engines was uh, modeled for the first time, people were really going mad about how can your plane go up to 30 knots in idle thrust and so on. Now, back in the day when we did this, in about 2014, I believe, there was no A320 NEOs yet. Neither was there a 737 MAX and that generation of engines that came with it. So people in flight simulation were going crazy all over the fact that we had that high idle thrust on the A320 back then. And nowadays, when you look at the A320 Neo and the 737 MAX, those things roll a lot faster than the other ones did back in the past. So the idle thrust you have on the um, IAE engines over here in the A319 is by Airbus Neo standards really not much, but compared to what we had like, well, about 10 years ago, this is actually quite a bit of thrust. All right then, let's give our purse a little ding. And look at that, cabin ready. All right, taxi checklist. Flight controls. We'll check them once we're established after the turn over here. Is that an inner marker? No, oh, please. Thank you, that's better. Okay, so, flight control track. Full up. Full down. Neutral. Full left. Full right. Neutral. And the rudder, yeah, it's moving. I'm not gonna check it all the way because I linked my nose wheel steering to it. So, taxi, taxi checklist. Flight controls, check. Flap setting, config 1 plus F. Radar and predictive wind shear. On and auto. Engine start selector, norm. ECAM memo, takeoff no blue, taxi checklist complete. So, I do have to say this looks like an interesting drawing here on the ND. Not exactly how it looks on the chart, if you compare it to, well, this. But we'll see. We'll get it, flo we'll get it flown somehow. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, manual flying here. Normally, when you have something like this where you need to fly really accurately, you would put the autopilot on. And the reason behind that is not that a pilot could not fly it as precisely manually. That is not the reason. But the reason is that in case any deviation happens and some idiots come about with a noise complaint, then you can blame it on the airplane manufacturer for the autopilot not flying things accurately, while otherwise it would be blamed on you as the captain. All right, so runway three five right, clear for takeoff. Cabin crew, prepare for departure. Okay, three five right, full length confirmed. Lineup checklist: takeoff runway, three five right, Charlie Alpha. Tikas, Tara, Pax 1 and 2, off, lineup checklist complete. Right side clear, left side clear, ready to go. Sounds good, take off. Manflex 69, SRS, Rome, auto thrust blue. Thrust set. I love it when you're so light and have those huge D rates. The thrust is set almost immediately. One hundred knots. You 
one rotates. Positive climb. You're up. Now. Alright, that drawing looks better now. Thrust climb, climb, auto thrust. Okay, we've got to keep the flaps out at first because of that speed restriction of 200 knots. But we will be climbing with the flaps out for a little longer. That looks good to me. Okay, time for 150. Okay, we can start accelerating. Flap zero. Speed check. Flaps zero. Right, we do this and this, and now we can enjoy the views. Okay, set's done that. Gonna cross check passing flight level seven zero now. Okay, and we should be well clear of all the noise trouble now, so let's take a shortcut here, go direct death it. Okay, insert. And you know what, we'll take an even further shortcut towards a busy. That's probably going to be the best we can get. All right, flies absolutely beautiful that airplane. Okay, autopilot one. Let's update that direct once more. Abezi, here we go. All right. So let's climb all the way to cruise level two four zero. And passing ten thousand. So passengers can go. Okay, nothing on the rat nav. Active to secondary. And we've got Truth 240, Op 366, Max 390. And finally, let's go ahead and clear the fix page. Perfect, that's all we need. So let's have another look outside. Caution, it is going to get a little bit louder now.
beautiful little airplane, isn't it? Even though it might be a little bit too loud. Well, on the other hand side, who's ever seen an A319 that close up from the outside and fly, huh? Okay, that's better. So, that's gonna be a beautiful little flight across the Alps. And Auto Otho really makes this look cool, doesn't it? It really gets close to Microsoft Flight Simulator. Not exactly there, but then again it is a different simulator, and that is for a reason. So, let's check this out. Almost 3000 feet a minute rate of climb. Now, you might be wondering, but we're sitting in only a 60 ton airplane, why do we climb only at uh, 3000 feet a minute, while you can do similar good rate of climbs in the A321 at 10 or 15 tons more? The answer to that lies in the engines that are fitted to the airplane. If we have a close look into the aircraft status page, then you'll see that we've got the IAEV2524-A5 engines. Now, based on the software, the engine is downrated to fit the airplane that it is slammed onto. So, on the A319, you will have weaker engines than on the A321s. However, that is obviously customizable by the airline, so theoretically an airline could slip an A321 engine under the A319. Now, if that is going to make much sense, I doubt it. It's only going to run the engine through quicker, burn more fuel, and ultimately not going to achieve too much. But you somewhat get the idea of where we could be going with this. Alright, it's a pretty short flight, so let's take a direct here towards Reutel. And looking into Flight Radar 24, that seems to be what they are doing most of the time. Basically, the way I imagine is this. Abesi is the border between Italian and Swiss airspace. The Swiss and the Germans are normally quite talkative to one another, so I could very well imagine that as soon as you talk to the Swiss ATC, they're just going to send you direct, well, maybe to the star entry, but maybe even further. I could well imagine to go direct, for example, to Delta Sierra 556, or maybe even the waypoint after. Looking in a flight radar, it seems that that's exactly what those aircraft are flying most of the time. So you know what? We're just going to go to Delta Sierra 522. Okay, insert. So let me show you a little bit of how I prepared for the uh, video and some of the stuff that I had a look at before I started to record. And up here we have uh, Flight Radar. And this is a couple examples of the real life flight that I went over before I started to record this. So first of all, I always go down to see where they parked and it's normally one of the two terminals up here so today I went down here then take off runway usually 35 right and you can see they taxi all the way around as well they even take the a uh, little bit more southern taxiway on this particular flight and then you can see how they do fly that noise abatement sit up here and then they basically do a right hand turn up there I could imagine this is probably a direct to I don't know Volta or something the like and then one straight line all the way until turning final. And that is pretty much what I went for with this direct. That is what I um, like to do on most of my simulator flights. When I know the airspace from real life, then I know which directs to expect. And usually it is always the same direct. Usually it always is. And um, I looked at a couple more flights and all of them basically flew this one very straight line onto the final. So for that reason I decided, well, then we are going to do the same. And that is what I normally do, to um, figure out a little bit more realistic routing. Because the original route we'd used was one from um, Ediglas, so it was a real life flight plan already. But you could see how there were all those little turns in there. And, well, that was just something they never flew. So, speed, vertical speed, 1000 to go. Let's have another quick look outside.
It looks really good, doesn't it? And it's nice to see these small little airplanes. Like, we got so used to the longer airbuses, seeing the small ones is really something for a change here, isn't it? Okay, now let's go back into the cockpit though. I heard your ears for long enough, old star. And... old cruise. Okay, let's start with a little bit of a setup. It already tells us to enter the destination data, so... Why don't we go straight for it? We can close all of these, and now we are looking for Stuttgart. Oh, this is what we need. Okay. So... Arrival, we don't need that anymore. We're going to go straight onto the approach, and it's going to be the ILS approach, runway 25. And then we also take some taxi charts down here and down here. Okay, perfect. So, the plan is a fairly easy one. We land on 25, we vacate pretty much at the end over India, and then we are almost straight at the terminal. Let's do a little bit of landing performance and see what that's going to turn into. So, compute that. Probably not going to do conflict full landing. Keep it on low auto brakes, and that's perfect. 773 meters margin, so we can pretty much just let it roll. Unfortunately, you cannot calculate zero auto brakes in the airplane. You've got to do something with um, at least an auto brake one or auto brake low, talking Airbus. Okay. So, for the missed approach, let's see that once more. Go straight out on radio 252 Stuttgart at 5000, crossing 5.6 uh, miles or 5000, whichever is later, turn right 339, crossing radial 277, turn right onto 233 in Mount Lubrock. Okay, so we'll take Sierra Tango Romeo on enough 2 that's going to be with a 252 course. And then Lima Bravo Uniform with a course of 05. What's that again? 053 inbound there. Okay, so 053. Perfect. We don't need any ADFs, so VOR, VOR is the setup as we've done it already. Landing now is going to be Stuttgart 25. Like that. So, speed looks about fine, not too fast, not too slow. So, let's have a quick look into the weather once more, 1020. Like that, temperature 25 and the wind 040 at 5. So, that's a little bit of a tailwind there. But normally, in Stuttgart, they are going to run a configuration like that. Because if we have a look into the airport chart once more, you will see that the main apron is over here, just about at the threshold of runway 07. So what they do with light and variable winds in Stuttgart is they run what they refer to as a suicide operation. So you have runway 07 for departures and runway 25 for arrivals. And that way, aircraft have to taxi the um, least possible time. However, obviously it means controllers have to be a little bit careful as well because you will have departing and arriving aircraft into the opposite uh, directions. So, overview, that's what it looks like. That's the Romy 07 threshold, that's 2-5, so planes land, land under here and up straight at the apron and from the apron and taxi out over here and then depart straight away again. And that is what it looks like. Okay, perfect. So let's finish our setup. That's going to be minimum 1381. With a config 3 landing. And we need landing config 3 up here as well then. Okay, perfect. So that is that. Fuel, 34 minutes extra. Secondary flight plan, I'm just going to keep a copy of the active with the full arrival. 
just in case some things change and we get to descend a bit later. So, last thing for us here is the wind. So, on this flight I've just decided not to use any... Yeah, basically not to use any of the um, uplinks at all. Just to do things manually once again, because when you always uplink everything, you kind of start forgetting. And it surely doesn't hurt to um, do these things occasionally, every now and then, manually. Okay, so wind at level 200, 251 at 16. So we've got 251 at 16 at level 100. And then... Oh, did I enter at level 100? Yeah, no, this should be at 200. Does it work like that? No, okay. Well then, just gotta type that thing in again. So, 251 slash 16 slash 200. Oh, come on. Really? Well, then I'm gonna put it into here, and it's gonna sort itself automatically. Like so. Okay, and then 242 at 12 in level 100. So, 242 at 12, and this time it is indeed at 100. Okay, that's better. Cool. So, with that we have checked pretty much everything there was. So, we can go ahead with the approach briefing. Okay, MSA on the arrival, the highest is going to be 4,600 down in the south. It is basically direct for self-establishing on the ILS approach for runway 25. Minimums 1381, go around is straight at via the um, 5 miles outbound of 5000, whichever is later, right on 339 until radio 277, then right on to Lubrock, climbing 5000 feet. Extra fuel, 34 minutes, 1.1 tons. Guidance is going to be managed approach, however, I'm probably going to fly um, it manually. Landing flaps 3, stop margin, we've calculated at 773 meters. Uh, reversers idle and auto brakes low. Planned runway exit is towards the end over India, all the way over here, and we're going to park probably on an outside position somewhere over here but maybe onto a terminal position like 13 through 15 as well we'll have to see about it hotspots for taxi in we have the intersection between several taxiways down here luckily coming out of india it's less of a problem than if you were inbound so if we look into it then we basically go straight at into lima 2 mike and then we end up around the parking gates over here any questions? No? Alright, perfect. Then I'll do a very quick PA to the passengers and then we are done already. Ladies and gentlemen, from Flight Deck, this is your captain speaking. We are going to start our descent towards Stuttgart in about 5 minutes time, remaining flight time about 20 minutes. Weather in Stuttgart currently very nice. The sky is clear with a temperature of 25 degrees centigrade. We would like to thank you very much for flying Eurowings today. Hope that you have enjoyed your flight as much as we did. And we look forward to welcoming you again on board of the next one. Thank you very much for your attention and we see you all again very soon. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren aus dem Cockpit hier, Kapitän. Wir werden in Kürze in den Flug Richtung Stuttgart beginnen. Die Flugzeit jetzt noch etwa 20 Minuten. Das Wetter in Stuttgart, sehr schön. Klarer Himmel bei 25 Grad Celsius. Wir bedanken uns ganz herzlich, dass Sie heute Eurowings geflogen sind, wünschen Ihnen einen schönen Aufenthalt, gegebenenfalls eine gute und sichere Weiterreise und würden uns freuen, Sie bald wieder an Bord eines unserer Flugzeuge willkommen zu heißen. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Okay, so that is it. We're going to start our descent very shortly. Now, some of you have noticed maybe already the way how I'm handling the altitude knob of the uh, SU up here. Basically, you can see that by default, I'm leaving the selector that chooses between hundreds and thousands always in the hundreds position, and only when I'm actually changing something, I'm moving it over to um, be able to switch it around. So, when I'm setting my new altitude, I do it like this. Put it on the hundreds, put it down, oh sorry, put it in thousands, 
thousands, put it down, and then put it back to the uh, hundreds. The reason I'm doing it that way is because when you have the switch set to the thousands and you accidentally overturn it, or you accidentally hit it, or turn it while you're trying to pull, and so on, you name it, then basically, if you accidentally change the cleared value by one input, you are not really going to notice, because it is still a full thousand. But if you've got it set to the hundreds, and then you accidentally turn it, something like that, you are immediately going to notice. While well, something like that, you are rather unlikely to notice. So that's the... Um, magic behind the philosophy of operating that switch and where to leave those inputs by default. Okay, so top of descent in 5 miles, that means let's request descent from ATC and then we'll just go down straight away. Descent alt flat level 100 blue. So I did promise earlier on in the video that I'm going to talk a little bit about how you operate the IAE engines, or basically any Airbus engine that is fitted with an EPR gauge. And on here it is quite easy because you still have a round and one gauge. On the A330 you also have that, on the A340 however you don't. And that is where things get a little bit more interesting. Now it is actually quite easy. You have those EPR values, but let's be honest, who can set those values as precisely as you'd want them to be. That's quite hard, so for that reason, even though the engines are controlled by EPR, we still refer to all the pitch power values and everything in terms of N1. The only difference is that you actually control them by EPR. Now, there are quite a couple of different failure scenarios where the EPR gauge becomes unavailable, and if that happens, you can control the IAE engines with N1, just like you are used to, from your favorite N1 driven aircraft. Let me give you an example. So, I'm going to set the target thrust all the way down and disconnect the auto thrust up here. Now, we've got 60% N1 set with an EPR of about 1.0. But, let's say we wanted to reduce this to 50% N1. Now, as you can see, setting the EPR value over here is quite difficult. So, you see, you can barely make out a difference up there. But down here on the N1 gauge, you can actually make that difference out very easily. So here we go, 50% N1, but the EPR is just down by, you name it. So this is quite difficult to set up. For that reason, you're still referring to N1 when you're doing those settings down here. Okay, let's go back to auto thrust. Here we go. Thrust idle. Okay, and we're right on the descent profile, very nice. So that is about all there is to it behind the um, setup of the engines and between operating an EPR-driven aircraft. Basically, you put your hand on thrust levers, you move them, and you do that until you get the desired N1 target. It doesn't take very long to actually get accustomed to how to operate those engines, and eventually you'll be able to set the N1 just the same way like you are with the uh, little donut up here on your favorite um, N1 driven engine straight away. Quite easy after all, when you think about it. Okay then, let's also take a moment to talk about my default point of view. Now, the Tolis A320 family by default has this as the um, point of view. Now, to be honest, I don't really know why they did that, but I do know that this is about as far from the viewpoint you have on the real Airbus as it gets. So as a general rule of thumb in order to set your point of view correctly, first thing to do, just take it quite a bit up front. Now the easy solution would obviously just be to use the um, triple ball indicator up here, but as you can see that's quite hard on the sim, so here's a little bit of a guide on how to set your view up. From the default view, just go up front, basically until the FCU matches the top of the displays up there. Now, as you can see, that is, however, a little bit high as a point of view, so you might want to go down a little bit more. And here's a little bit of hints that you can use. You've got the front of the armrest over here, and if that basically aligns 
with the um, bottom of the weather radar, that means that in terms of horizontal position, you are quite fine. Obviously, make sure that you are sitting more or less in the middle of the seat, like so. And then just make sure that you can still see the uh, top of the displays, so nothing is blocking your view on the displays there. And that is basically it. That is the correct point of view. Now, personally, I like to go a little bit further to the right so that I can see my engines correct, my um, engine warning display correctly. But that's really about it. So compare this that we've just set up with this, which is what I saved previously. You can see that I've saved even a little bit further to the right. We could do something like this. I suppose in the end, this all comes down to, well, your favorite kind of setup, doesn't it? Okay, and that is all there is to it. And to how to set those um, views up for the, in my opinion, better point of view than what Tolis had set as default over here. Okay, cool. So, we are descending so we can absolutely put our TCAS into the below mode. Difference between that, if you've got the TCAS in norm, it basically shows you targets within plus or minus 2,800 feet. And above or below, it shows you targets within 7,900 feet. So, since we're descending right now, obviously it would be beneficial for us to see aircraft that are below us. Now, in the simulator as it is right now, well, I don't have any AI traffic turned on right now anyway, so I'm not going to see anything. But if we have a brief look into the scenery of where we are flying, you can see that we've just crossed airspace into Germany. So if we go outside for a second and look what's behind us, you can see we've got Lake Constance over there. And from here on, you can see this is perfect VFR flying weather right now. And it is perfect VFR conditions down here in that there basically is no controlled airspace whatsoever. And then we've got the uh, Schwarzwald down here on the area. Well, this is not the Schwarzwald. Schwarzwald is somewhere more over here. But um, you've got beautiful VFR scenery down here and if you're flying over here on the weekends in real life you can be absolutely sure your TCAS is going to be filled with VFR targets. Now just around Stuttgart we've got a class Delta airspace so we are somewhat protected on our way in. <laughs> However we still need to maintain a good watch out. In my time flying as a pilot so far I've witnessed things of VFR guys flying in the controlled airspace and I've even heard it on the radios. Let me tell you a story over here. In Germany we've got the flight information service which is somewhat similar to the um, flight following in the US but we've got dedicated frequencies for VFR and we've got the controllers who are providing you traffic information. Now that is not an exclusive guaranteed service so it means that they are going to provide traffic information as good as they can. However, there may always be guys who don't have that transponders on. There may always be guys who have incorrect transponder readouts and so on. But whenever I'm flying VFI in Germany, that I am on that frequency because it just adds that additional layer of safety. Now, on there, I've heard a couple of stories where I was really like, what on earth is going on here? Let me tell you one of them. It was a rather rainy day, we've had a cloud base somewhere around 3,000 feet and some occasional showers of rain. It was something like into the region of autumn, so there weren't actually too many aircraft flying over there. Now, I've been flying from St. Peter Ording towards Dienstlaken at that time, which is basically from the um, German North Sea down south towards the uh, Ruhr area, close to Düsseldorf. And obviously the controlled airspace of Bremen would have been exactly along my route of flight. Now what I did, I asked the um, information controller if he could organize permission for me to cross the controlled airspace and that he did. And there was so little happening because it was a rather, well, it was a rainy day so most of the um, VFR pilots weren't flying that day. But approaching the class Delta airspace of Bremen where I had a permission to fly into I entered the airspace and then I heard somebody else on the radio 
who was also with the informa flight information controller, and when there is as little going on as during that time, then they will often warn you when you're about to accidentally fly into an airspace that you don't have permission or fly into a restricted area. So that's basically the sense of why that frequency exists. And obviously, take a guess what happened. Another guy flew right into the controlled airspace and the air traffic controller was in active contact with him. He warned him like, Delta, Echo triple X-ray, you're about to enter controlled airspace in uh, three miles. The pilot re responded, uh, negative, we are not. Controller said him, uh, yeah, confirm your altitude, is that that? So you will enter that controlled airspace in that moment. No, no, we are not, we are not going to enter that airspace. The controller tried a couple more times to warn him. And, well, take a guess what happened. Two or three minutes later, I heard on the radio, Delta Triple X-ray, you've entered control zone of Bremen Airport. Report ready, a copy and number. Absolutely lovely. The reason I'm talking about all this is because, well, we are flying around Class Echo airspace at the moment. In fact, in the very position where we are right now, I wouldn't be surprised if we are ex actually inside Class Echo airspace. And... Later on we will be within Class Delta, but even though the Class Delta airspace is a protected airspace, we are not at all going to be assured that there will not be any VFR traffic. For that reason, put your TCAS into the below mode. The further you can see ahead, the better it is for you. Even more so, there is one thing that you always have to keep in mind. We are flying IFR within controlled airspace, but if there is a VFR guy, in that same airspace, ATC is not necessarily going to provide separation. Obviously, in the real world, they will always do the best they can to provide as much separation as possible. However, ultimately, if that VFR guy is coming from the right, then we are the ones who have to give way. So we have to make an evasive maneuver to get around him. And that's the important thing over here. Even though we are flying inside controlled airspace, we, if there's, a, if there's another guy coming from the right, we have to give way. Okay then, let's go ahead, go down to 4000, set altimeter 1020. I've been talking quite a bit, we actually passed 100 already, you could see I've done the checks silently there while I finished up the story. So, set QNH 1020, QNH 1020 cross check, passing 8000. Now, checked. Approach checklist. Barrel QNH 1020. Seatbelts on minimum, MDA 1381. Auto brake, low, engine start selector, norm, approach checklist complete. Okay. So, I do remember putting the winds in from about 240 or so. Now they are actually coming from 300. So you can see we are getting a little bit above the profile over there. Even though that somewhat surprises me because 240 would have been a little bit more of a tailwind component. And seeing that we have a bit more headwind than anticipated, I'm actually a little bit surprised that we are going above the profile. But then again, remember the golden rules of um, Airbus? If things don't go as expected, take over. So, in other words, here's the speed brake. We should be within airspace delta at the moment, but nonetheless, let's maintain a good look outside. An operator whose name I'm not allowed to tell actually goes so far as to whenever they are flying through airspace class Echo. Now we are inside delta over here, but just as a reference, when they're going through airspace class echo, they would reduce to the slap speed. So they would go flaps one when they are below 10,000 and then fly the S speed. That is roughly 180 knots. And the reason they do so is because it just gives you that bit much more time to look out, which might make the difference between being able to see and avoid or not being able to do so. 
Okay, we've got our speed back, we've got our profile back. Speed brakes retracted. And then we are turning onto the base. Another quick word over here. As for the difference between flying managed and flying selected modes. We're going managed right now. And Airbus has conducted a study on the A320. And that was exclusively on the A320. Where they averaged the fuel usage between pilots flying a lot of managed modes and pilots flying a lot of selected modes. And it turned out in that study that using managed modes as much as possible is going to save approximately between 50 and 70 kilograms of fuel per flight. Now that might not sound a lot, but now imagine an airline, like for example EasyJet, operating, you know, 300 of those aircraft. So that means they're doing thousands of flights a day. Now, let's just assume 2,000 flights and 50 kilograms of safe fuel per flight. You can quite easily get to tons of fuel being saved there. And tons of fuel actually equaling like 10 tons, 20 tons. And if you put that straight into euros, you end up at some, saving somewhere of 20 to um, 30,000 euros per day just by flying managed on your entire fleet as much as possible. Obviously pilots are still allowed to use selected modes where needed, but if you've got those managed modes available, then do use them. Okay, speed, glide slope style, lock style, cat 3, dual, autopilot 1 and 2, flaps 1. Speed checked, flaps 1. Okay, glide slope. Go around altitude 5000 set. Okay, 10 miles out, 229 knots, that is a bit fast. Let's use a bit more speed brake to get rid of the speed. When you're established on final, you need to evaluate whether the speed brake is the right tool for you or whether you should just drop the landing gear straight away. You can see right now we're 8 miles out, 230 knots ground speed, and you can see how little effect the speed brake actually has. So, gear down. And now you see something. Now you can actually see that we're in an A319. You can see the airplane doesn't have that much energy. We're at around about 60 tons right now, compared to a usually higher weight on the A320s. So you can see that we have a bit less energy. And having less energy means that we also have less energy to destroy over here. Okay, flaps two. Speed checked. Flaps two. Okay, now the speed brake is in. And here we go. Alright, speed is nicely under control. Flaps three. Speed checked. Flaps three. Landing checklist. Pika memo, landing no blue. Landing checklist complete. So, a little bit of tailwind at the moment, but that's fine. Okay. Autopilot off. Auto thrust off. Let's do the last bit of it ourselves. So now let's see. In Microsoft Flight Simulator approaching Stuttgart, oh you always really get um, low on the approach profile because the glide slope is simply not placed correctly. Let's see if things are better in X-Plane. Well, things do look a lot better in X-Plane, actually. We are right on the glide, and we are right on the puppy. Perfect. That is how I want to see things. Checked. Come on, airplane. 
Minimum. Continue. 50, 40, 30, 20, reach on 10, 5. I'm letting it float a little bit right now. Here we are. Passengers will be happy. Okay. For some reason I can't get my engines in a reverse. Well, spoilers. No reverse. Decel. And manual brakes. We'll just let it roll to the end now. And that's it already. Welcome to Stuttgart, everyone. I do hope that you enjoyed this one. 70 knots. Okay, next taxiway to the right. That's gonna be India, Lima 2, Mike, to the gates. So I just praised X-Plane for the more accurate ILS, and then I see taxiway lights straight on the center line. That's exactly where it has to be. Of course not. Okay, here we are. So. Okay, let's continue straight ahead, and then start APU. Come on, here we go, that's better. Well, that's interesting. I can't seem to be able to, um, here we go, that's better. Okay, so let's take the next to the right. Don't overshoot too much, it's a short aircraft. Well, here we go. Not the best turn into a gate and probably a little bit fast as well, but we're getting there. That's what counts. Okay. After landing checklist, radar and predictive wind shear off, after landing checklist complete. So, APU avail. Cabin crew, all doors and park. Engines are running down. Here we go. Okay, slides disarmed, fast modes off, parking checklist. Park and breakout shocks. Sets, engines, off, wing light, off, fuel pumps, off. Parking checklist complete. Okay, trucks in place. Brakes are off. And that is it. Perfect. Alright, everyone. Thank you very much for flying along. I do absolutely hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, do let me know in the comments below. Let me know what you think about the A319 and do let me know what you think about the IAE engines and how much you like to fly EPR driven aircraft. I'm very much looking forward to your feedback but in the meantime would like to say thank you very much for watching. Hope you have enjoyed this one and I am very much looking forward to your feedback as that is what keeps the channel getting better. So leave a like if you actually like the video as it does help with the YouTube algorithms. 
Leave a comment to let me know what you think about it. And if you're up for more, be sure to hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, I would like to thank you very much for watching. And if you really loved what I'm doing over here, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching, and I'm looking forward to welcoming you all again very soon.